Well, thanks so much for coming, everyone. It's really nice to, to see you all. Um, as Sean said, I'm going to be talking about the research that Natalie and I have been doing for about the last kind of five or six years now, looking at women's experiences in the miners' strike of 1984 to 5. Before I kind of get into women's experiences in the strike, I am going to talk a little bit just about the strike itself. Um, for anyone who doesn't know all this background, but some of you will know all this already, apologies. So the 1984-5 miners' strike lasted for a full year from March 1984 to March 1985. And it was a strike not over demands by the workers for higher wages, but over opposition to pit closures. So at this point in time, the coal industry is of course still nationalized in Britain. So it's run by the National Coal Board, um, but the National Coal Board is obviously uh, very directly shaped by the government. The government at the time, of course, is the Thatcher government. And the Thatcher government had come into power in 1979, quite hostile to the miners and their trade union. And one key and obvious reason for this is that the miners trade union, the National Union of Mine Workers, had brought down the previous Conservative government, the government of Ted Heath in 1974, when they undertook a national strike demanding big wage rises, led to a state of emergency, um, shortages of power. Ted Heath went to the country for the general election and lost. There was a lot of kind of bad feeling on the part of the Conservative Party. And Margaret Thatcher really wanted to sort of break the power of the, the National Union of Mine Workers, which was one of the strongest, most powerful trade unions in Britain at the time. That's particularly the case because coal was used to produce most, not all, but most of the electricity in Britain. Like it puts the miners in a really powerful position at the head of a really powerful kind of trade union movement. So the Thatcherites wanted to kind of um, reduce the power of the NUM. And by 1984, they had put preparations in place to try and do that, in particular, stockpiling coal at um, power stations and getting the police ready to kind of fight, break any kind of strike and protect any men who wanted to continue to work. So the strike was precipitated by, sparked by, the announcement of pit closures. And miners, over 140,000 miners at the height of the strike came out to protest against and to try and reverse these pit closures and maintain the industry and maintain the communities that the industry sustained. However, one really crucial factor in the strike was that controversially there was no national ballot and that meant that in some areas, particularly Nottinghamshire, which is a big, really productive area, many miners continued working. There's lots of activism that went on across the country to support the strike. Today, today we're going to be specifically talking about um, the activism women. And the strike is, I think, particularly significant um, moment because the loss of the strike, the fact that the miners ultimately lost, and the pits were almost entirely closed in, in the sort of five to eight years after the end of the strike, and all of the kind of turning points in modern British history. It's the moment where kind of Thatcherism sort of triumphed and the power of the NUM and also other trade unions in Britain, the end of the strike was greatly reduced. So the traditional narrative focuses, on, focuses largely on men and men's activities, as you can kind of see in this picture. This is, the strike is seen in this narrative as a political battle, and of course, more right-wing tellings of this story emphasize the violence of picketers and the way that they were trying to enforce um, their politics on the country, whereas the left-wing strike sees the strikers, the striking miners as, as heroes trying to defend their industry and their communities and the strength of trade unionism. In Britain. What our project has done is to really focus on women's experiences in the strike. And this, at the heart of the project is um, interviews that we've conducted with about 100 women from all across the country, um, including down in the Kent coal field, in uh, Nottinghamshire, Yorkshire, South Wales, the Northeast, Scotland, so all over. And we've interviewed both women who supported the strike and women who opposed the strike as well, trying to get a picture of how women survived during the strike. And also we've done kind of whole life story interviews, so we're trying to place women's experiences in the strike 
in the bigger context of women's changing lives in the post-war period. So I'm going to just tell you about a few of our kind of main findings and play you a few clips in order to give you a sense of some of the oral history material that we have collected for the project. So one of the biggest kind of themes of the project and of women's recollections of the site is very simply and very obviously the struggle to survive. Because the men were out on strike, they weren't getting any wages, they also were not getting large amounts of strike pay from the NUN, which couldn't afford to give them strike pay. They got a small picketing allowance for men if they went picketing. But this lack of an income meant that most mining families my husband was on strike, were in really serious financial difficulty. And I'm going to play you a little clip from Alison Anderson, who's one of the women who we interviewed from up in Scotland, where she talks about um, how, what it was like being uh, quite a young wife, actually pregnant during the strike, and how she was kind of scraping together money from here and there to try and make ends meet. Alison was living with her husband and young son in High Valley Field, Fife, when the strike broke out. Can you remember the strike starting? No, not really. You went in strike on the March. Uh, then I fell pregnant with Hazel. And then we moved house. We had always wanted to move down to a wee village called Curis. And we always wanted to move down. And I got a letter saying on the November that we, we had this house. And I thought, oh my God, I want the house, but there's no way we could afford to move down. And uh, so the social work gave us their van. And we took the house in Curis and we moved down, but it was all electric. And I never had the money to pay this electric because my flat in Barrowfield was a coal fire. Right. So then down we went on the November and that's when things were really got really, really hard for us because uh, because it was all electric heating and I had a wee boy I, I put the heating on in his room I put the heating on in the living room and these gas bills were coming and oof you know really fast and furious these electric bills and then I got a, one oh I was on a way over a hundred pound day and I phoned them up and I told them I can't pay this my husband Strike and minor, this is what you've got to pay for it. If you don't pay for it, we'll be out to cut you off. So and you're pregnant at this point as well. I was pregnant, yeah. So the other was pregnant. We got nine pounds ten pence a week because Maggie Thatcher says that we were all getting strike pay and we never got any strike pay. We never had another penny. So we had £9.10 a week to live off of. And then after a few months, the social work department came out to the club and spoke to all the miners and says, look, we will give you food lines for the co-op and um, you don't have to pay it back. So great. So I got £20 every week food line and uh, what I had to do was I would go round the shops with my mum, round the co-op and I had a calculator and I would pick up £10 worth, then I would hand the calculator to my mum and she would pick up £10 worth, we would go to the till and hand over the £20 voucher, my mum gave me £10 that I paid to my electric so I still only had the £9.10 a week to buy fresh milk and bread and then nothing else. And um, then after the minor strike, we all got letters telling us how much we owed. So I think you really get a sense from that clip of just how difficult kind of daily life was 
paying your bills, buying food, keeping your house or your flat warm, which is obviously particularly difficult if, or particularly important if, um, as, as with Alison, you have small children. So this is the kind of background reality for the wives of striking miners during the strike, and this is going on for an entire year. But alongside these very kind of um, difficult memories that we've um, heard from women who we've interviewed, there's also um, another side of the story, which is women's activism in the strike. So during the strike, women from all of the coal fields that I mentioned earlier, organized into groups to support the menfolk who were on strike. And also the small number of women who worked in things like the pit canteens or the pit officers who went on strike, because some of those women did go on strike as well. They formed this network called Women Against Pit Closures, and they did an array of things, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a moment. They did the kind of what we might see as the traditional women's work of running soup kitchens and providing food parcels. This is an image on the slide of a, a woman in uh, South Wales um, giving a food parcel to a striking miner. They also did a lot of fundraising in order to raise the money to put on these food parcels and soup kitchens. And they also um, showed their support for the strike by going on marches and demos and also by standing on picket lines alongside strikers. It's important to remember that only a small minority of miners' wives and other women from mining communities and mining families were activists. But the work of these activists was absolutely crucial to keeping the strike going for as long as it did, for keeping the strike going for an entire year. So it's really, really important. So let me tell you a little bit more about um, what our interviewees have, have told us about, um, about their work. One of the kind of stories that's told about women's activism in the strike in some of the things that were written at the time, like this piece that was written in Spare Rib, which some of you may know, is a big um, kind of feminist magazine in the 80s. And some of the things that have been written after the strike about women's activism have suggested that the movement of women against pit closures, as Maureen Douglas says here, released women from their isolated role in the home into organizing, something uh, they have never done before, bringing them into contact with aspects of politics they've not really known about previously. So one of the um, one of the things we wanted to do, Natalie and I, in our research, was to kind of test this uh, this um, account of what women did in the strike and how it kind of changed them. So some of our interviewees have told us um, the stories of how they set up um, soup kitchens and food parcels. And in, in this excerpt, um, I'll, I'll give you a moment to read it. This is a, an extract from Pat Smith's interview. Uh, Pat was a miner's wife from Dillington in South Yorkshire, and actually her husband was president of the local branch of the NUM. And in this um, little, little extract that I've um, put on the slide, she describes how they set up um, food parcels. So I'll just give you one, one moment to kind of read that. So you can see in this extract that the, the activism that Pat undertook sort of got going in quite an ad hoc way as women like herself, who were the wives of striking miners, kind of came together and uh, looked around for opportunities to support their husbands and to support the community. And because many of them had, of course, experience of mass cooking, um, they chose those women to kind of run the soup kitchen which they set up to feed striking miners and their families. And they took on the work of providing food parcels, which is of course really important to miners who are struggling to kind of, um, miners' wives who are struggling to feed their families with almost no money coming in often. This next slide gives you a sense of the kinds of things that uh, women like Pat were putting in the, um, the food parcels that they were distributing. This actually comes from some archival research that we've done in South Wales. And this shows what, um, was going in early May 1984 into, soup, into food parcels that were being distributed by this support group in South Wales. And I think you can see that it is not uh, a large amount of food. Nevertheless, this was absolutely crucial to many families. The other big element of um, women's activism in the, in the strike was this work of going on, on rallies and marches in order to demonstrate their support for their menfolk. 
and going on picket lines. In fact, only a minority of women actually went on picket lines. And perhaps there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that more men seem to be opposed to women going on picket lines than were opposed to women doing those, as I said, perhaps more um, typically feminine roles of providing uh, food parcels and soup kitchens. So standing on picket lines, which were of course quite a kind of masculine and, and often in the minor strike a very um, violent and potentially quite dangerous space, this seemed to many men and, and to many women as well, like uh, it might be more dangerous, uh, potentially inappropriate for women. And it certainly seems to have kind of challenged gender roles more profoundly. I'm just gonna play you one more clip from Aggie Curry, who's another one of our interviewees, um, who is from South Yorkshire and in this clip talks about the experience of going on picket lines. And I think this will give you a sense of um, some of the reasons why some people thought this was controversial. Anyway, after that, I started going on all women's picket line. Yeah. They were good and still going out all over the place speaking and what have you. Um, so where did you go on the women's pickets? It mostly Nottingham's. You went to Nottingham yeah, a lot? mostly of them. I went to Rosso. Uh, I was pretty dressed at Rosso because they were bloody crazy. Is that there. Rossington? Yeah. yeah. Bloody crazy them pickets through there. Were they? Yeah, bloody crazy they were. And... Um, what, in terms of how, how crazy how? Well, if any lads got arrested, they'd go put bricks through police with uh, coppers, uh, yeah, um, oh, and you call police stations windows and that. Right. If so they, they were quite violent. Yeah. And uh, I thought, God, if I get arrested here, I really didn't want to get arrested. And then we'd done a mass through Rosso, and I can remember somebody chucking a brick through somebody's window. Must have been the scabs out. And I thought, a baby could have been made in there. Mm. So I went crazy. I said, how do you know they want a baby there or an old person there? Mm. How do you Aggie, in fact, during the strike was arrested. Um, in fact, many times. There was only a small number of, uh, a small minority of women from mining families who got involved in activism. And it was only a very small minority of those women who actually went on picket lines and even smaller minority who actually got arrested but some of them like Aggie did and were, were really on the, the kind of the front lines of this struggle. One, one other important part of our project has been to look at not only those women who were activists and who were supporting the strike or who were at home kind of supporting their husbands on strike uh, but um, not involved in activism. We also wanted to look at the experiences of women who actually opposed the strike. That has included um, us talking to women like Christine from Doncaster, who was working for the National Coal Board during the strike in the office, and who uh, herself decided to continue working during the strike. Um, and so she actually was one of the people who was crossing picket lines in order to go into work. So she was facing picket, picket lines of striking miners. And in this clip, um, she's describing what that was actually like. So I'll just give you one second to kind of read through that. So we've kind of got it from um, both sides, the experience of being on a picket line, um, from women like Aggie who were standing on those picket lines and from women like Christine um, who, were, who were working through the strike and who were crossing those picket lines. And it is really clear just what a kind of intense and frightening experience it would have been, quite possibly whichever side you were on. The experience of going picketing and the fact that women went picketing and stood on these picket lines in the strike is one of the things that has been um, most often sort of cited as evidence that women were doing something radically new in the strike, that working class women were, as someone like Maureen Douglas was kind of arguing in Rib during the strike, kind of taking on a, a dramatically new role outside the home in the strike and getting involved in politics in a way they just hadn't in large numbers before. And our research has shown, I think, that many women did have very important new experiences 
during the strike, particularly if they got involved in activism in the strike, which did leave them feeling changed at the end of the strike. But the other side of the picture is that our research has also shown that many of the women who got involved in activism in particular during the strike, they had often been politically active before in various different ways. Probably the most common way for them to have been physically active before was in their own trade union. Um, many of the women we interviewed had, were working um, during the strike or had worked in the past and had been part of trade unions themselves. Uh, others have been involved in the Labour Party or in CND, the Campaign for Nu Nuclear Disarmament. And so actually, one of the things that we argue is that uh, it needs to be really recognised how important working class women's previous political experiences were in shaping the activism that they were able to undertake during the minor strike. So I just want to finish with a couple of legacies. Um, a couple of kind of concluding thoughts from the incredible women who we interviewed. Many of the women who, who we interviewed, and, I, I feel, and this was particularly the case for women who were involved in activism in the strike, actually did look back on the strike in some ways as a positive experience. I think perhaps Aggie's comment on this slide sums it up the most. So Aggie is the woman who you heard from earlier who was talking about going picketing um, and, and what a violent kind of um, experience picket lines could be, but she says on this slide that she would do it again in a heartbeat, and that, that's something that she insisted on all the way through her interview with us. It's an incredibly intense experience, really difficult in terms of trying to keep families going with um, often almost no money coming in, but also an experience that many women got a lot in that of um, in terms of coming together as a community. Uh, in terms of supporting other women and gaining support from other women, uh, in terms of standing up for the, their political beliefs and the, the things that they um, believed in and, and opposing Thatcherism. So for many of the women that we interviewed, um, the strike is not looked back on straightforwardly as a positive or a negative time, but there are really important lessons that many of them feel that they learned during the strike and that they wanted to kind of pass on through doing their oral histories with us. All of those oral histories are um, available for future researchers to use at the National Coal Mine Museum for England, uh, which is near Wakefield. And some of them are also um, little clips from them are up on the, the, um, the little online exhibition that we put together. Um, so there's lots of great resources that hopefully um, are, are kind of available for people to use to do further research into um, using the interviews that we collected. And we've also put together various other resources, including these educational resources, which um, Natalie is going to share with you now. I'm going to stop sharing my slides. Very much, everyone. Okay. Thanks for that, Florence. Now I'm going to try and share my slides. Let's hope, hope it works. Right. So I'm just going to talk for sort of 15 or so minutes now, 15 minutes or so, about the um, educational resources uh, that we've designed for the project for key stage three when I say that we've designed I think more accurately be more accurate to say that they've been designed by um, Will Bailey Watson and Tim Jenner in conjunction with us so Will Bailey Watson is the um, PGCE lead in history at the University of Reading so in, in a sense a colleague of mine and Tim Jenner is now the Ofsted lead for history actually although he was a teacher at the time when he uh, helped to design the resources and basically we really want to make some educational project uh, educational resources for the project but me and Florence were highly aware of the fact that we haven't been in a classroom since we were at school ourselves so we thought you know we've got to get actual teachers to design this um it has it has to be said it's actually Will who's designed this powerpoint so he's talked um, we've had sessions like this before and he's talked through these slides himself so I'm trying to be or trying to pretend to be Will tonight I'm not quite sure how successful I will be but I'll do my best um, these are trial resources still um, we're really interested in your opinion and what we can do to tweak them and there are extensive teacher notes um, available for each lesson so there's three lessons for, for four of those three lessons which will helpfully um, explain the rationale behind all the sort of pedagogical decisions that have been made. All the resources are available online on the UCL website, so hopefully you've seen that link that I've sent in the chat. 
And at the end of today, I just want us to think a little bit about the aims um, and of you know these resources and how the sort of thinking behind the resources could be um, sort of decoupled from the context of the miners' strike and applied for other historical contexts throughout the curriculum. And I think that's particularly important for areas where schools might not actually have close links to um, you know coalfield communities. So the key aims for bringing this project to the classroom, we have five. So these are the aims that uh, Tim and Will decided were really important. So firstly, it's guided by a genuine historical inquiry about the 1984 strike. Um, obviously that genuine inquiry is mine and Florence's inquiry. It involves the pupils as active participants in uncovering oral histories. So it's really important that we get the students out there doing oral histories and becoming historians themselves. The third aim is to bring practicing historians into the classroom. So we've made a few videos of um, myself there um, to try and you know, bring the sort of expertise that sort of academic historians have into the classroom. We want students, number four, to be able to positively and constructively reflect on that process of collecting and analyzing oral histories. And the final guiding aim for bringing this project to the classroom was for students to be able to sort of have a tangible outcome that captures a meaningful sample of um, historical thinking and in some ways hopefully contributes back to a community understanding of the past. So when we designed these uh, resources at first we were really thinking about them being used in sort of classrooms in ex coalfield community areas where we hope to some extent, the pupils will have at least heard of the miners' strike. They may or may not, to be honest. So it'd be quite. I think we thought it'd be interesting for students to be able to really engage with their local pasts and to think about what, how the history of the area sort of shaped the sort of local context that they're living in today. So, as we've already talked about, these resources are guided by myself and Florence's research. Um, you'll see when you look on the educational resources that um, there's sort of links to our project and there's sort of links to some of the interviews that we've done and there's a link to a 15 minute video that we've produced in conjunction um, with the National Mining Museum. And so we've got all that sort of intellectual research sort of scaffolding the project in the background. And the inquiry question that Will and Tim came up with as the sort of the question that was structuring the whole sort of three lessons is what does oral history add to our understanding of the 1984 to five minus strike? So I've got a few notes from Will here. He says that history teachers should all know that an inquiry question when well planned provides an opportunity for pupils to draw together all the substantive knowledge they have to analyze this through a disciplinary lens and to reach powerful shared outcomes through debate and argument. And Will said that he and Tim settled on this as the sort of guiding question to sort of structure the three lessons because he felt that sort of the minor strike itself sort of brought in an obvious narrative arc with an analytical thrust there around oral history and women's voices. And he also liked the fact that this question sort of alludes to the fact that there are already understandings out there of the miners' strike. It's a well-known public event. So he's interested in sort of deconstructing perhaps some of those received narratives that we have around it. So under this question, there's three lessons, as I've said. So lesson one, that is all about establishing what that dominant narrative is around the miners' strike. And it's also, to be honest, a lesson which is all about really telling students about the minor strike, giving them a sort of outline of the actual history of that dispute so that they're really sort of secure in their historical knowledge and understanding of what the minor strike actually is. So we're really just doing the, the groundwork in that lesson. In lesson two, this is a bit where we really get into the oral history stuff. It's all about preparing the pupils to conduct an interview, hopefully with a woman that they know in their community then hopefully they'll go away and do that homework. And in lesson three, they'll be able to analyze their findings and they'll be able to reach some conclusions with each other. This second aim 
of these guidelines is to involve the pupils as active participants in sort of doing oral histories. So whilst I was talking with Will and Tim, I was saying like, you know, what I would really love in an ideal world is for students to be able to go out and do their own oral history. I know that myself and Florence have found the process of doing oral history really powerful. It's a really fascinating way of doing history and it's also a really enjoyable way of doing history as well. I'm, I'm very evangelical about oral history so we'd love for students to be able to do that but we're of course incredibly aware that it's easier said than done. So Will and Tim thought a lot about how we might scaffold this. So the lesson one homework is simply for students to find someone to interview. So how easy that is might depend a little bit on where you live. So if you live in a pit village in, or an ex-pit village in South Yorkshire, for example, that might not be too difficult to find someone or at least to ask a friend of a friend. Will and Tim also suggested that if, for teachers who are sort of coming in from coalfield communities, that as a backup, they might be able to source one or two people who maybe could come in and, and do a group session with various students instead. But also, we're very, very aware that some students may just simply not be able to find people to interview in the end. So don't worry, we have set up an alternative homework for students who are unable to do that interview. And that's actually based on the oral history recordings that myself and Florence um, have done, which are online on the website. And that alternative homework is based around getting them to analyze those oral histories instead of their own. But hopefully, they will find someone who they could maybe interview. And so the lesson two is about preparing them for that interview. It's really making them think a little bit about what questions they're actually gonna ask, how the practicalities of an interview work. There's also gonna be a few short videos from me just uh, talking a little bit about the oral history process. Lesson three is all about analyzing those interviews. So, it is, um, it is sort of dependent on students having done homework of some sort, hopefully a homework where they've interviewed someone themselves, but if not, this alternative homework where they look at the oral history transcripts and the interviews that myself and Florence have done. Will and Tim suggest that if students haven't done any homework at all, and I hear that it is known, um, that you actually give them com uh, copies of the transcripts of um, the interviews that myself and Florence have done. Those are online as part of educational resources and to make them do them in class so they can participate in the activity. So aim three that Will and Tim really wanted in terms of, as I say, structuring these lessons was to bring a practicing historian into the classroom. In that case, this is moi. And really part of the point of this is um, to sort of show them that historians aren't just old men with sort of tweed jackets, you know, sort of sitting in their um, studies smoking a pipe. I mean, there are some historians like that. Will was very excited. Obviously, I lived down south. He's very excited by the fact to have a northern accent. And he thought, you know, it would be good for students to recognise that sometimes, you know, historians come with all different sorts of accents. They're from all different sorts of backgrounds. They're not necessarily super posh. And, you know, that historians come from communities like Doncaster and Barnsley as well. So that's part of the rationale of bringing um, a historian into the classroom. But it's also to give like, students an insight into what we actually do, right? So these three short videos are just me talking quickly about the project and why we wanted to do it. And so I talk a little bit about, you know, being from Doncaster and having the grandfather's in mind and stuff like that. We have a second interview with me, just again, very short, just two minutes, where I'm talking about project findings. And in the sort of third video, I just give them five top tips for how to go and do their own interview. So you'll get the links to all of those videos are on YouTube, but the links are all in the PowerPoint. So the fourth aim is for students to positively and constructively reflect on the process of collecting and analysing oral histories. Now, hang on, just a minute, I need to go back. Myself and Will and Tim were all talking about how ambitious this is. And I think we're all well aware that this is really stretching uh, for key stage three students. So it might be a bit of a case of just seeing where you get with it. But nevertheless, I think it's really useful 
if students can ever think about not just doing oral history, but like what oral history actually means, what are the problems with it, what are its advantages, you know, thinking about how we actually do history itself. So Will and Tim designed a, a range of tasks, which I'm going to show you on the next slide, helping those students to answer these questions. So they're, we're asking them how oral history helps us to sort of complicate established narratives. We're asking students to think about how all historians use an intersubjective approach to see what questions were asked and when. Now I've used the word intersubjective here, to be honest, I think you could probably just use the word interactive and it might be a bit more um, understandable, I guess, for 13 or 14 year olds. The point here about using this term intersubjective or interactive is just to underline the fact that an interview, it's a two way process, right? You don't just come to an interview with a list of questions and sort of you're not just a robot just saying those questions like you're a human being you often change your questions that you ask as you go through an interview you react to the interviewee's personality you act to what the interviewee tells you as well if they tell you something that you weren't expecting that's really interesting you don't just go oh well you know wasn't interested in that so i'm not going to ask like you you deep you delve into it so we just want students to sort of get that point really and we also want, and again, this, this is probably quite ambitious, but we want them to think a little bit about how oral historians analyze the fallibility of the interviewee, right? So here we're talking about issues around memory, right? So that's probably the easiest way to explain it to students. You know, people don't remember things that happened like four days ago accurately. So, you know, there's issues around how people are gonna remember things 40 years ago. So you can talk a little bit about those issues with memory. I talk a little bit in one of the videos about how we can sometimes overcome some of those uh, problems by sort of contextualizing it with other sorts of primary sources from an archive. But we, we would also like them to think about the fact that sometimes people misremember, not just as a problem. Yes, it's sometimes a problem, but it's also revealing in itself, right? And the example that we give on the teachers resources is we say sometimes we get people had a difficult experience in the minor strike and they sort of say how rubbish their lives have been since so then we go back through the interview and we actually see some quite happy things which have happened to them in you know the 1990s and the 21st century so we have to think why is the interviewee telling us this right so it probably tells us something about you know um how devastating the strike was for the community perhaps it might be the interviewee trying to make a political point about how destructive the strike was. So there's lots of different places you can go with this issue around the fallibility of the interviewee and memory. You might just have to keep it simple, but you might be able to push that a little bit as well, depending on your students. So these are the exercises that Will and Tim came up with, which again are on the uh, worksheets uh, for that third lesson for helping students analyse oral history. So we've got a sort of first exercise, which makes them look at the interview that I did and to question whether or not it complicates that received narrative about the miners' strike. Got that second um, sort of thing around the flexibility of the intersubjective approach or the interactive approach. And so here we're asking students to look again at their interview and say whether or not the questions that they asked, whether they stuck to their script, whether they kept on adapting their questions in response to what the interviewee was telling them. And then that third uh, set of sort of exercises around analysing is around the sort of fallibility of the interviewee. And that is asking students to think about how sort of issues around memory shape the story that they were being told. So the end point, the final aim of these uh, resources was to produce a tangible outcome that captures a meaningful sample of the historical thinking and possibly, maybe, hopefully contributes back to a community understanding of the past, right? So the third lesson concludes with pupils drawing together all their thinking and their work together in a written task. I'm not quite sure whether you can see that properly on the slide, but this uh, slide simply says, bringing our lessons together, what does oral history add to our understanding of the minor strike? So you get students to sort of put their hands up or to write things down. And then Will and Tim also suggested that there would be scope for setting up a display around what the students found. 
you know, if you're in sort of ex coal field areas, it might be quite a powerful thing to have up in a history classroom. And so again, just a quick reminder of what those key aims were for bringing this project to the classroom that Tim and Will came up with. I'll just let you have a quick read about of them again to sort of just refresh your memory. Hopefully that's made sense to you and you can see where the sort of, I guess, the rationale for the resources that have been designed, where, that, where it all comes from. We also thought quite a bit about how we might adapt this across the curriculum. Obviously, most areas in Britain are not ex coal field um, areas, but we still think that, you know, getting students to do oral history is a really great thing to do. So we might think about the sort of um, different topics we might want to do oral history with, which might be more sort of um, adaptable to a local context. So, for example, if you live in an area of um, high that's had, which is quite ethnically diverse, has had a sort of history of, of a lot of migration in the last sort of 50, 60, 70 years, you know, you might be able to sort of set up an oral history project around uh, the experiences of migrants to the area. More broadly, you could do a project around, for example, um, experiences of schooling, um, girls' experiences of schooling, if you're interested in bringing women's voices into the classroom. And I'm just saying that as a little plug because I've actually done some resources around uh, the experiences of education um, that some of our interviewees had um, for the Secondary Education and Social Change Project, which was a, an academic research project carried out at the University of Cambridge, which was all about secondary education in post-war Britain. But I've actually done some resources on that. And if you click on the website there, you can go and find teaching resources. I'm really keen, actually, to think about different ways in which oral history can be brought into the classroom. And I have sort of said uh, to my university, to my managers, that I will work with teachers to think about other ways in which these resources can be brought to key stage three classrooms in non-mining areas. So if there is anyone out there who's interested in um, working with me on that and sort of helping to develop some, you know, lesson worth of resources, and please do get in touch with me. Will and Tim were also thinking about places in the school curriculum where we can have these sorts of resources. So these resources are really designed at a sort of year nine level. So you might be able to teach your sort of local history at key stage three. Tim, Will and Tim also said about the OCR historical environment module at, at GCSE, I'm gonna be honest, I don't know really what that is. So I'm sure you guys probably all know much better than I do. And um, Will and Tim were also thinking about how we might adapt some of these um, resources further. And they were thinking about the ways in which we might sort of slightly change the questions that we're asking. So we might not be asking about disconnects between national narratives and local narratives, or we might want to be asking about complicating one historian's narrative instead. You know, there's various things you can, you can do there. And they also say, oh, you know, given that we're all so used now to this virtual world, that it might even be possible to get in touch with historians who are working on various academic subjects to get them to record just very short one or two minute videos that can be shown to pupils in the classroom. Right, we've come to the end now. Hopefully I've done a passable imitation of Will there. As I say, I'm keenly aware that I'm not a teacher myself. Um, so I'm really interested in, to hear, in hearing people's feedback there, but I'm also, you know, happy to take any questions. Okay. Um, I think I, I think I speak for everyone. Um, that was a whistle stop tour, but nonetheless, I, I just feel I feel like I've learned so much. If I'm completely honest. Um, I, I just wanted to thank you both um, for both parts of the input because I think. Um, that contextualization is really was really important to the resources and things like that. Um, I guess what what I like so much about this, and I, I think other teachers would say, is that um, it really sort of like demystifies that procedure of like I say procedure, but like what a historian actually does. I think, um, especially for my students, we've been trying to sort of um, show them that being a historian is not just about um, hiding away in an archive in a door in a dark corner of somewhere um, but is actually about um, 
things like oral history so just for a different perspective if people don't um want to teach it as an isolated thing we've um just we're going to weave it into um our year nine where we look at the development of women's rights in the 20th century sort of following on um from i guess following on from the suffragettes for year nine really um but looking at we look at dagnum obviously but that's quite like 20 years is before um, and I think they get this view that from that moment on women are always involved in activism or involved in striking um, but this with the oral history as well can provide both sides for them um, is there anybody that has any questions at all um, great to think about how to apply it to key stage history um, yeah I think oral history is great as well and it sort of opens up students to be able to sort of pick out their own themes as well and maybe they can follow someone and pick it out themselves um which i think is really important um i guess i have a, I, have a, I have two questions that are just sort of my own before anybody give people a chance to put them in the chat um my first is sort of directed i guess at both of you um when completing the research um you said that you were surprised by um some stories that you heard what would you say is probably the most surprising thing that maybe you didn't go into and anticipate that you would maybe learn or um that you went into and you thought and someone you're expecting something completely different um either one of you that was be my question oh that's a that's a good question sean um <laughs> in some ways like a wealth of stories that we could tell i don't know florence can you think of any obvious examples I was I was thinking about um, the interview that we did with a woman whose husband wasn't on strike. She was in Nottinghamshire, and she really interestingly told us about. She described how when the picketers came from Yorkshire, where obviously almost everyone was on strike in Yorkshire, in Nottinghamshire, the majority of people didn't go on strike. The pickets all came down from Yorkshire and she and other women in the village, the pit village where she lived, sort of felt so kind of, um, they felt under siege from the picketers in the same way or in a somewhat similar way to the way in which people in striking villages, say in Yorkshire, felt under siege by the police. And she and some women in her village actually sort of formed, to, formed together into a small group and kind of marched through the village, kind of reclaiming the space from the picketers which I found really surprising um, and interesting because I've never sort of heard about that, uh, any kind of, you know, it's a sort of activism, but from the, the non-striking, from the working miners' point and their families. Um, so that was one thing that, that surprised me. I was going to give exactly the same story, actually. So, <laughs> um, so I, I just think, I think I, I love the idea of, especially with the resources, with the ability to sort of question that narrative um throughout because I think for me as well um I, I don't think I had that I think I had that narrative in my head that it wasn't such a small minority of women sort of thing so um even for myself that I've been um that's been questioned for me now as well um shall I, I I don't think we have any other questions Sam did you have any questions at all that you wanted to ask or anything further before we close for the end of the day yeah, no, there, there's not anything in the chat at the moment. So if you do have any questions, then, then feel free to fire them in. And I guess my only thought was, and, and maybe this is a, a bit of a cheeky question, but obviously you've both conducted so many oral history interviews. What's the most kind of interesting thing you've heard or the most revealing thing that you've um, heard from people you've been interviewing? <laughs> Again, it's, it's so hard to pick out one single yeah. moment. But I mean, we've had so many amazing stories. I mean, I would say something that's really um, interesting about the oral history process is just how much some people will tell you. Not everyone. Some people are quite guarded, and which I understand, to be honest. You've never met this researcher before. But some people use, it's often about two or three hours if you're doing an oral history. Me and Florence did sort of full life histories. We didn't just talk about the strike. And for some people, it's amazing how they will open up and tell you really quite intimate things about 
about them about themselves um it's a sort of space for them really to actually work out some things about their own lives and their own past um I had a woman who very unexpectedly I've got to keep her anonymous actually because she asked for anonymity um but only about 15 minutes in sort of suddenly um called her dad a bastard and she had really clearly not sort of thought she would sort of go there in the interview and it's sort of she surprised herself and then she started really sort of analyzing the relationship that she'd had with her her father it was such a powerful moment um and these moments are it's such a privilege to hear people's stories sometimes it's quite confronting to be honest as well um we're not trained therapists so sometimes people get very emotional so there's quite a lot to navigate there and you know to be ethical to make sure that people aren't left upset by an interview but yeah I can I mean I can think in terms of I can think of more in terms of really powerful emotional moments that I didn't expect to happen in is a sort of we've had a lot of those in the interviews I don't know Florence is there anything you want to add I was just thinking about how varied the interviews are I mean there are obviously some things that come up again and again you know stories about how you cope when you have almost no money coming in you know the things that people did you know we had lots of people talked about you know chopping up their a fence to get firewood to make a fire in their house to keep their family warm that winter for example but also there is this incredible variety I suppose this goes back to what Sean was just saying I think the one of the amazing things about oral history and about the possibility of of sort of students potentially doing it with people they know, their own families, you do come up with just an incredible wealth of different experiences. And you realize that the narrative that is perhaps most prominent in the public debate is only one part of the story. So I think, you know, if you read an article in The Guardian today, for example, about women in the minor strike, they'll all have been activists and they'll all be kind of saying, oh, you know, it, the strike was was tough, but it was brilliant. And that's really, really important. And the work of those activists was, you know, absolutely incredible and, and sort of astonishing. And you're, you're kind of in awe of what they did in the strike. But I think it is really important and interesting to remember that other people who didn't have that experience, who weren't activists or who opposed the strike or who worked through the strike. Um, so that's kind of what I find almost most exciting about oral history. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really profound, actually. And I think especially for us as as history practitioners, especially at the moment, there's a, a real push rightly for us to include more diverse voices and include more nuance. Um, and, and actually, it, it's something I've never really thought about before um, using the classroom, but I can I can see how it'd be incredibly useful, actually. Um, I actually, bizarrely, when I did my master's, I did a, a master's in public history, which was really I was prolonging the inevitable for a year and um, spending another year as a student. Um, but I did a, a, an oral history project um, actually into about football hooliganism in Liverpool. Um, but kind of, yeah, it, it led to very, very different outcomes than I expected. Um, a lot of the people I was interviewing now live very normal lives. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a good point. It, you know, it, it brings diverse voices, doesn't it? It brings difference of opinion and nuance. And I think that's something as history teachers we should always be trying to find in our classroom. Um, so it's a great idea. Um, there has been a question that's come in. Um, thank you, Helen. Uh, Helen asks, do any of the women I assume that you, she means the women you talk to. Do any of the women regret taking part and do they still stand by what they said? Good question. I don't think any, any do really regret um, the activism that they undertook. I think women's perspectives on the strike now are quite varied but they were also varied at the time because there were some people who thought that going on strike in March 1984 was a mistake and that the union you know it was a misstep um it was a miscalculation and they weren't going to win and of course the fact that they didn't win has made perhaps more people look back and say well could it have been different but it's really difficult because the union was sort of provoked into striking and it would have been hard for the union to just kind of say oh you say you want to close all these pits 
okay, sure. So it's such a it's such a difficult thing to weigh up. Would it have been better if they'd done it a different way? And I think even people who look back and say, oh God, if only it could have been different, often also feel, well, you know, the government wanted to destroy the industry and, and that is what happened. I also think it's important to say that if it's people who regret taking part, they might not have wanted to, to volunteer themselves for the project. Mm. So this is another complicated thing about oral history, right? It's never it's difficult to get representative samples. I mean, there's a debate we could have about what a representative sample might even look like. It's always it's, it's generally people who want to tell their life stories, right? And that generally means it's people who are comfortable with their lives, who are comfortable with their life histories and what they did in the past, who feel they have a reasonably positive or happy story to tell, right? So you've always got this issue of what we might think of as sample bias in a sort of social scientific way. But yeah, that's that's a problem for oral history. That it's I say a problem, it's just the fact of what oral history is in terms of the people who come forward. You always know there's this sort of dark, dark mass out there of stories that what for whatever reason you're not hearing. That's always quite frustrating. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but you know, you'll always come across against against this issue. Yeah. This is really, um Sorry, I've just seen the, a question that's come up in the chat from Gemma. I don't know whether you want to read it out. Or... Yeah, I, yeah, just so the words right in my mouth. Um, <laughs> so Gemma says, um, I'm undertaking my PhD on women's uh, women in the miners' strike in South Wales coal fields at the moment. Um, she's had several messages saying that she I should leave the strike alone when I've asked for interviewees. Did either of you get responses similar to that when undertaking your research? Yeah. Well, I think maybe because we didn't approach people directly for interviews on the whole, but rather we waited for people to come to us after extensive advertising. We didn't get that so much. I have to say, I mean, I'm from Doncaster and I you know, know of people who were um, involved in the industry. I did ask a couple of um, close friends whether their mum or dad would, would chat to me. And there was a little bit of they weren't people who were political activists and there was a bit of hesitancy in like, oh, you know, that needs to be left in the past now. So I did sort of, I haven't like counted that on a low level. Um, I would say though, I know someone who, uh, an academic at Sheffield University, a bloke called Jay Emery, who's done a PhD about the not belonging in the Nottinghamshire coal fields. So Nottinghamshire was where most people, not everyone, but most people remained working throughout the strike. And he found it incredibly difficult to get people to talk to him about the strike. And he was always told, we don't talk about that. Look, just, just, just don't go there. So I don't think you're alone there, Gemma, basically. And I think it depends on how contentious a strike was in a local, the strike was in a local community as to how easy it is to get people to talk about it, to be honest. Yeah, and I suppose kind of linked to this and what you were saying before, to a degree, the people that you are getting are to an extent kind of quite self-selecting aren't they aren't they i suppose which mm. makes yeah. it tricky um i'm sure um sean there's nothing else in the chat at the moment so unless you had any follow-up questions i think we're ready to go ahead and close um, i mean i could probably ask questions about the process all day if i'm honest um, just because it really interests me um but no what do, do you know what? i think we we shall end it there thank you everybody um, for joining us tonight. It is our last event of um, this academic and very strange academic year. Um, also, can we give a big uh, thank you to uh, Natalie and Florence for joining us, taking out this hour um, of your evening um, wow. to do that for us.